Okay, welcome back once again to the Spirit Engine. Last time we dug up Elin stars to gems from the desert and today we are going to use them to try to bribe Kalenko into letting us ride the earlier train. Then we are going to go to the Arcane Library, locate a copy of the Serpentine Dictates and find out what exactly this uh, Cabal of Mages that's been chasing us is actually up to. Uh, Kalenzo here is duly impressed by finding those jewels and uh, he apparently used to be a treasure hunter himself but his expedition failed and that's probably why he mentioned them specifically. Uh, Matthew here explains that they are actually not real diamonds because the Elin dynasty was quite poor but I don't know if that argument actually means that the gems are as valueless as he implies. Maybe their material value isn't as high but uh, if they are still recognizable as one of a kind artifacts they should still be pretty valuable. I mean if you get down right down to it a painting isn't really much more than just uh, color on fabric right? Okay. We are uh, traveling first class, he accepts our offer, he's going to kick the scrawniest looking family he can find off the train and tell them, yeah, you're leaving later. <laughs> our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we get a quick interlude, we are seated in a first class carriage, our party has a chance to rest, except for Peter, who is nervous and agitated, uh, makes sense. His father is still being held hostage and we've already agreed not to try to rescue him, but of course that decision isn't sitting too well with him makes sense. Here we get a pretty cool interior shot of the train. Uh, notice our old friend from World 1, the mine inspector, Mr. Grimes. He's been in the background in this whole world and he's on the train too. He's uh, one compartment to the right of our party. Okay, the train has come to a sudden stop. Somebody must have uh, pulled the emergency stop chain and Peter is gone. As is our spirit. So. Yeah, the spirit has followed Peter, the stone circle where Frontier agreed to meet us is not far from here, and we're going to run after Peter and hope we can catch up to him before he does something stupid. Meanwhile, at the stone circle, Peter is going to do something stupid. Uh, the Frontier Guardsman here, that's the first time one of these faceless minion guys has actually gotten dialogue. Uh, he's informing Executive Wilson that we've arrived after all, and they've just been clearing out of the stone circle, so the heavy armor is gone. He's running off to inform Miss May, while those uh, three here are going to negotiate with Peter. The Serpentine Acolyte, as before, can see the spirit while the guard and the executive can't. So only magically attuned people can see the spirit. The game is at least consistent about that. I don't really know what it means, but it's consistent. Unfortunately, there's been an accident. Um, quote unquote accident. The problem is Peter's father has tried to escape has injured several guardsmen and he was killed during the escape attempt. The body is in storage. So the new deal Frontier is offering us, the spirit for the body of Peter's father and the guardsman who killed him is going to be reprimanded. Not a particularly great deal, is it? Yeah, Executive Wilson here feigns some sympathy. Peter appropriately goes absolutely berserk and we have a battle on our hands. Uh, this is the only solo battle in the game. As you can see, Peter's mana and health those have, both have been buffed significantly. That's another one of those mood effects I mentioned initially. This is our first fight with this Frontier Guardsman and the Serpentine Acolyte. Uh, the battle isn't too difficult, but if, if you've designed your first party member to act as sort of a support role, then this can be difficult. Interesting little detail, the attack the character uses to kick off the battle and take out Executive Wilson is actually their quote-unquote signature attack. For Peter it's Sharpshoot, for Clara it's Life Drain, and for Clematis it's, I think, Silver Bullet. It uses the same uh, in animation as it does in battle. Okay, our party has caught up with Peter, not quite in time. They are all dead. Matthew is really angry at Peter because he almost got himself killed and the spirit was almost lost and no, no permanent harm was caused but Peter's father is still dead and yeah. Our situation isn't exactly improving. At least the arcane library is fairly close. Uh, we can take the back entrance into the arcane library and maybe we can actually get closer to putting an end to all of this madness. As you can see, the uh, rest of this world is locked off now. We can only visit the library anymore. So there was a point of no return there, which is why I told you to do your level grinding there if you can. Uh, the 
place has been ransacked, all the mages are gone, and the entrance is blocked off, so this isn't getting any better. <laughs> yeah, we are in a really, really bad spot here, and Peter, as you can see, is getting pretty depressed, which makes sense, his father just died, and this is another mood effect, uh, his MP are slashed in half. Um, with Peter, that's not so bad, because sharpshoot is a very slow firing skill, and that means his MP consumption isn't the highest anyway. We're just going to reshuffle some equipment uh, so that we can face the battles ahead better. But yeah, if your first character is Clara, this is actually very bad because she consumes a lot of MP as Life Drain is one of those two MP attacks I mentioned earlier. There's a save statue here, make sure you save in a new slot uh, so you can actually go back into level grinding if you find the battles here are too difficult for your party. We're going to face uh, more of the Serpentine Acolytes as we just did, and this time they have backup with them. Those Slave Reptilians, I'm not sure what the significance of those is, but they are immune to energy attacks and they are large. We don't actually use energy attacks, so that's not a problem, and as they are large, they take bonus damage from our Sharpshoot attack. So those aren't going to be such a big problem. The Serpentine Acolytes are a little more difficult. Their main thing is that all of their attacks are magical, so those magical bolts uh, they are not resisted by armor. They also have this life drain attack. Uh, we just interrupted that one, so we didn't actually get to see it. But this life drain attack is basically uh, it constantly depletes the targeted character's HP as long as it's ongoing. It's uh, basically a different version of Old Man Franklin's life drain attack from way back in World One. It does deal a ton of damage, but if you can strike the Acolyte while it's still ongoing, then the attack will be interrupted and the Acolyte will be stunned for a short while. So that's good. Uh, their Rainbow is really paying off because Rainbow hits many characters at once. Okay, here was that attack, we just interrupted it with Hand of the Gods, and there's another one ongoing which we can't interrupt so easily, we have to hope for Hand of the Gods or Rainbow to hit that mage randomly. Uh, the character in the middle there, the familiar, is one of the reasons this area is so difficult. Those don't look like much, uh, they take no magical damage, which is the biggest problem. They are undead, so you can't life drain them. And most importantly, their attack deals poison damage, so they have a fairly strong initial attack, and then another fairly strong attack that damages you over time. So you want to take those out quickly if you can. One consideration here would have been to switch Peter to Speedfire, since those familiars take additional damage from normal attacks and Speedfire hits three times. But I ran the numbers real quick and it turns out that Sharpshoot deal still deals slightly more damage per second with our skill setup. A Sharpshoot is generally at its best when you're trying to punch through damage resistances. That's the more common option, which is why I prefer uh, Sharpshoot over Speedfire. Although Speedfire definitely has its moments where it shines. Okay, um, the Talisman of Judgment we picked up earlier is definitely paying off here. Those are energy attacks, so while those can't harm the Slave Reptilians, we don't have a problem with the Slave Reptilians in general, and they can't harm the Familiars. We're also, we're also using uh, Matthew's Holy Bolt attack in this part of the world for once actually, because those deal bonus damage to the undead, and they are energy attacks, and they are two bolts. So although we have put no points into Holy Bolt, the familiars are taking a ton of damage per attack. I don't know if it's actually higher than Hand of the Gods, but it's more targeted, and it's more MP efficient for sure, because Hand of the Gods, again, uses two MP. We've also been granted a bunch of skill points, partially for uh, surviving Peter's solo adventure there. We are going to spread those around fairly evenly, but we are still going to focus on one attack skill per character, and we're not going to bother with uh, building up backup skills. The parties here are also randomly generated, except for the first one, so occasionally you get something supremely annoying like the triple familiar party. We've put Pippa on uh, Celestial Lighting here, since that's, her, that's one of her stronger attacks that aren't magical, but that's not going to really pull its weight. It does deal damage, but not a whole lot, so we are going to put Pippa on Kinetic Shield for the duration of this battle. Since Kinetic Shields don't take poison damage and absorb the entirety of an attack, with no possibility for spillover, the kinetic shields are really good against those familiars. Um, as long as there's three familiars, they could break through the shield, but now that there's only two left, we should be able to uh, keep from taking too much additional damage. 
those familiars again are the game telling you hey maybe you shouldn't be relying too heavily on life drain life drain suffers from uh, a problem that many ultimate attacks and rpgs have uh, think of the instant kill attacks you find in games like final fantasy those cost a those cost a whole bunch of MP, are expensive to get skill points wise, and they kill an enemy instantly, but they fail to work on the enemies where you would actually want to use them, such as bosses. And Life Drain, I feel, is sort of similar in this game. Life Drain is very, very good against uh, most random encounters. It has some marginal utility in that it can strike some enemies who are otherwise uh, shielding themselves to be immune to damage, but ultimately it's just not worth it because in all the spots that are actually difficult, uh, life drain fails to work for one reason or another. Which I think is sort of a shame. The idea seems to have been that life drain is a good attack, but it can't be your only attack, but the problem is, because the difficulty in this game is so lopsided, life drain just ends up as a useless attack. Here we have another interesting mix of party members uh, for enemies. There's a Slave Rapillion, a Familiar and a Serpent and Acolyte. I don't know if this one's randomly generated, but if it was, the random number generator is showing some uh, capacity for strategy because Slave Rapillion at the front, Serpent and Acolyte at the back is the correct setup. This isn't posing such a big... Uh, this isn't posing much of a problem for our party though. We are fairly low level, but our party is very well set up in terms of skills and equipment, so... While we haven't done any level grinding, we are still getting through the library with comparatively little trouble. There's only one familiar here, and the Serpentine Acolytes attacks are magical anyway, so we haven't put uh, Pippa onto Kinetic Shield as before, it's just not worth it. Uh, I said before that later in the game you have to start switching up your skill chains a whole lot, and uh, this is a good example for places where you actually have to do that. This is why I said I wouldn't call the Mango Republic the game's high point, because that implies it goes steeply downhill after that, and that's just not the case. We've made it through the uh, entrance of the library and we've reached the ancient history branch. Uh, luckily, this area hasn't been vandalized quite yet, so this implies that the Serpentine Acolytes don't actually know the layout of the library. That may be notable. Okay, we found a copy of the Serpentine Dictate, and I'm not going to read this to you, but you should really uh, switch to watching the video now if you can, and if you haven't been doing that before, so you can read along, because this stuff is actually important. The Serpentine Acolytes believe that the world was in a, t was a terrible place, uh, torn apart by war, and that there was a mage, Sergal the Wise, who rewove the world. Basically, she destroyed it and created a new world, a better kind of place. Uh, she left the world afterwards, she's still walking the spheres, and the reweaving was not perfect. So they basically believe in, uh, in this eternal recurrence. They believe in, in this whole circle of death and rebirth of the world and of reconstruction of the world so that you always reach a better form. That's also the meaning of the name. There's a symbol of the snake biting its own tail. I won't even try to pronounce the name of that thing, but uh, you can probably look that up. <laughs> It's a really old cultural symbol of uh, death and rebirth, and the Serpentine Circle basically believes that applies to the world too. They believe that uh, Circle the Wise reincarnates as the Holy Catalyst whenever the world is due for destruction and recreation, and they have identified Angelina as the Holy Catalyst. So they believe that by adding Angelina they will bring about the Apocalypse, and with the Apocalypse the possibility for a better world. I think that's actually kind of an interesting setup. Uh, Angelina, meanwhile, note that Sergal is supposed to be this uh, ancient, super-powerful mage, but Angelina has nothing but disdain for magic as far as we've seen. So, it remains to be seen if she actually is the Catalyst, uh, just, and just doesn't know it, or if the Serpentine Circle is wrong, or if she has, uh, or if she has deceived them somehow. Meanwhile, there's another of those imps here, who is selling some talismans and some armor. Those aren't really worth it. And there's going to be another shop in the next world where we can get much better equipment anyway, so we're not going to bother with that. Here in the Sanctum of Dust, what's upcoming is probably the hardest boss battle in the game. And with an interesting bit of uh, exposition at the front again. So if you've uh, switched away from the video again, if you're doing pause or something, or I don't know if you're playing cards while you're listening to this video, I want you to switch back to the video at least while the grandfather is talking. 
uh, he's literally called the grandfather. That's the name of the uh, head of the Serpentine Circle. We're going to reshuffle our equipment again. We're going to change the skill chains up a little because this is a really, really tough battle and our usual approach of just firing uh, off all our most damaging skills isn't going to work here. This is another of those points where people often hit a brick wall because the grandfather forces you to use uh, very different strategies from what you've done before. Luckily, there's a spot here where you can level grind even if you overrode your only save. You can always go back to the entrance of the library and kill those Serpentine Acolytes over and over and over. But like I said before, I'm not a fan of level grinding as a strategy and it's definitely not a whole lot of fun. Okay, um, the equipment reshuffling we're doing here, notably we are taking away Pitta's talisman for now so she can put on the party healing talisman instead. Okay, the grandfather here is calling us sinners and he's telling us that our obstruction of the reweaving is not going to go unpunished. Uh, he calls the books here the history of a doomed world, a catalog of impurity and sin, so yeah, he's... Uh, this is the head of the Serpentine Circle and he says uh, we shouldn't call him insane. Uh, the world is in a corrupt state, only his order understands how bad the suffering really is and the world is really needs to be destroyed and recreated so there can be less suffering. Um, he rightly points out uh, that he says the very fact that we are able to carry out the reweaving justifies it. That's an interesting philosophy I have to say. <laughs> yeah, the grandfather ultimately he's still an RPG villain but he's one with who actually has a motivation for wanting to destroy the world and that's that he believes that the next world that will be created afterwards is going to be a better one. Uh, the grandfather has one of those familiars with him and that's extremely annoying, but the most annoying part are of course his own attacks. His basic attack is this magical bolt he fires that deals medium damage but he fires it very quickly so the damage adds up really really fast. His most annoying attack is the life drain attack. His is a much stronger version of the life drain attack that Franklin uses. It doesn't work like the life drain attack of the Acolytes. What he does is he doesn't deal a small amount of fixed damage, he just slashes the character's HP in half. It's not possible to resist or evade that attack, and the shields don't work against it either. It's just, he targets a character, the character's life is slashed in half. Fortunately, uh, the damage runs down, so that he can't kill a character with that attack. His second attack is this Rune Rain. That one also bypasses shields and resistances, but fortunately that just deals a small amount of fixed damage. I think it's like uh, 5 damage, uh, 4 or 5, uh, in that ballpark. So, Shields are extremely vital to surviving the battle with him because most of his attacks can't actually outright kill you. You'll be spending most of this battle at a critically low amount of HP, but because his only attack that can actually kill one of your characters is this magical bolt attack, you want to keep the magic shield up at all costs. That's why uh, we have taken away Pippa's talisman for now, she's not going to be using rainbow during this battle, she's just going to try to keep up the shields. Notably, the grandfather also resists magic attacks and is vulnerable to normal and energy attacks. So again, uh, putting Peter onto Speedfire would have been a consideration. But we're not doing that and uh, we would have had to put points into either Speedfire or Rifle Attack for it to be an effective strategy and like I said, that's not how you get through this game. Because in the next world you're going to encounter enemies that resist normal or energy attacks again and well, if you're relying on an attack that hits often and deals little damage per attack, that's a really bad spot to be in. Okay, we've beaten the grandfather down to about 1800 HP. Uh, another annoying thing about him is whenever he uses this life drain attack, he heals himself. So you want to fight defensively to some extent, you want to keep shields up whenever feasible, but you can't fight too defensively or he'll just heal himself up again. Okay, and this is probably the worst troll, troll moment this game pulls on you. The grandfather, once you finally get him around, down to around 1000 HP, throws up this regeneration shield. He's completely invulnerable while that's up. The game technically considers him undead while he is inside the shield, so you can't hit him with life drain either, just in case you had any funny ideas. We're going to use this time to try to heal up as much as possible and to strengthen the magical shield. Uh, this kinetic shield here, I put that one up by mistake. The grandfather has no physical attacks. As you can see, his HP tick up pretty quickly and he regenerates completely, so he goes back up to full health. Uh, it's important that you kill the familiar as quickly as possible because he doesn't revive it when he heals up, but if the familiar is still alive while he throws up the shield, the familiar will also be inside the shield and I'm pretty sure the familiar can still attack even while it is shielded. 
So taking out that undead little imp thing is really a vital strategy in this battle. The grandfather's shield has gone down again, so we can hit him. Um, we've healed up a little, but we're running very low on MP, so if we're going to win this battle, it's going to be very close. Uh, note, we've made a very good decision in keeping the favorite drapes around. Those meteorite thing deals 120 damage to the grandfather per hit, and that's actually pretty significant. So, in preparation for this battle, you want to pick up all those passive attack items and you want to hang on to them as long as possible, long after you think they've become obsolete. Okay, he's down to 3000 HP, but our party is almost in single digit HP and we are almost out of mana points. Peter's the only one who still has any left and we are in a real bad spot right now. Um, Matthew is normally our strongest attacker, but we've had to put him on healing for this battle. So the only one in our party who's actually pouring damage on right now is Peter. Uh, because the grandfather's offense is so brutal, you really have to switch to defense sometime during this battle. But like I said, you can't switch to a purely defensive approach because of the grandfather's life drain attacks. This battle really requires a lot of strategy and it's really intricate. Um, most boss battles in the second game are like the battle with the grandfather and that they require very in-depth knowledge of what the boss is like, what skills you have, and they require you to switch skills a whole lot. And I think that's actually pretty cool. This battle against the grandfather, like I said, is probably the most difficult one in this game. Uh, it's definitely the most intricate one, I would say, simply because his strategy is so complicated. Okay, Matthew is down to 1 HP, both of our other party members are dead. Uh, luckily, the life drain attack runs its damage down, so Matthew was able to survive there. We've gotten off another attack with Peter, the grandfather is down to 200 HP, but the runes are floating down, if we can get off one more attack... Yes! Yes! We did it! <laughs> Uh, this was impressively close. Like I said, uh, two of our party members were dead. The third one was on its last, on his last eight point of HP. And as you can see, the runes that would have killed us were already floating down. So, exciting times. Uh, yeah, the grandfather is a brutally difficult battle. And although I know exactly what's going to happen and how he works, it still took me like six attempts to kill him. Okay, let's switch our equipment back again. Uh, Peter's mood effect expires around this time. It's not like he's gotten over the fact that his father has died. That would be a little heartless. But he feels he's avenged him, so that's good. We've made it back out of the arcane library, so now we just have to locate Felren and... Oh, yep, yeah, it's an ambush. Uh, this is uh, the heavy armor the guardsman was talking about earlier. Mr. Waters here has stopped us. The troops have amassed enough firepower that they can kill us instantly if we try anything funny. And now our party actually learns about the involvement of the Frontier Corporation. Uh, we as the players knew this all along, but this is where our party learns of it. Angelina here has been identified as the Holy Catalyst by the Serpentine Circle. Uh, she doesn't really seem to buy that. It's, um... But notably, she actually gets some pretty sweet powers like this retaliation shield. You shouldn't accept, uh, expect to strike her because this thing will happen. <laughs> uh, Matthew here doubts that she's the same person as Sergal because she lacks compassion and decency. Uh, Angelina May here says she won't explain herself to us. The Circle ex uh, accepts her as the catalyst and she's going to kill us now and take the spirit. Fortunately, Falrin chooses this moment to remember that he can cast teleport. <laughs> I wonder why he didn't just teleport us to the library to begin with, but I won't complain. He's going to rescue us real quick, and that's a good thing. Uh, he's caused quite a commotion at Clark's Tower too, so uh, he's actually been doing his job as a background character. We've escaped with the spirit. Angelina is, of course, pretty angry. Uh, they couldn't stop his magics because most of the circle is dead, uh, and Angelina says no, she won't fail at this late stage. She's calling everything back to Clarky's Tower, the heavy armor, the remaining members of the circle, and that's where we are going to. So the next chapter is going to be the last one in the game. Everything's coming to a head. We're going for the final confrontation, and maybe we'll be able to find out what is actually going on here if Angelina is the Holy Catalyst, if she's not, and if not, what she's actually up to and why she's trying to bring about the apocalypse. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Goodbye.